So at the end of the biggest investigation into a traffic accident in French history, the French authorities have concluded what most suspected within days, that the crash here was caused by a drunk and speeding driver. Rubbish, a cover up, definitely a cover up. I think it's a little bit suspicious for an accident. 85% of the ordinary people of this country believe Diana was murdered with my son. It's not only me. So many unanswered questions about the crash. Can I sit down now? Yeah. Just go to the store. So, the American, over your shots. Yeah. 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 In a fine example of British legal understatement, the coroner said he was mindful that there was some speculation in some quarters that this might not have been a simple car accident. I remember vividly we were having a seminar. And I got a text from my office at Scotland Yard which said that um, you've been asked to do the inquiry uh, into the death of Princess Diana. And I thought, surely that means the Metropolitan Police are doing it. I rang up and they said, no, you've been asked to do by the Royal Coroner to do this personally, which was unprecedented for the Commission to do an inquiry of that nature. I knew from the very beginning of this inquiry that it was going to be exceptionally difficult. The allegation is that the most popular woman in the world has been murdered by the Queen's husband together with MI6. That's very serious stuff. I remember the newspaper headlines. I also remember what was coming over on the television and the radio. And it was obvious that 85% of the population believed there was a conspiracy. Even relatives of mine said there's something behind this and someone's murdered her. That was part of the decision for me to do it, actually, because at the end of the day, uh, we had to get to the bottom of what went on here. So, after six years, this inquest has finally opened with the eyes of the world upon it. The only question, will it tell us anything we don't already know about the death of the world's most famous woman? Around half the population is now surfing cyberspace and in this internet nation the average for each family is eight hours a week, the equivalent of a full working day. So just what is everyone doing online? we're investigating was conspiracy to murder. It's not going to be a quick and easy inquiry. You know, people immediately said, Lord Stevens is part of the establishment. He's going to find that there's nothing in there. But in actual fact, there were some things in the conspiracy allegations that needed to be sorted out. Well, we got together and we decided that we were going to look at every single allegation that had been made. Every single one. It was 104 allegations. I can probably best liken it, when I first looked at it, to, like, there's a mountain in front of you. It's just a mountain. And I remember the whiteboard at Scotland Yard, where we tried to break down the allegations into areas or themes. The royal family, engagement, pregnancy, you know, MI6, blood, the collision. Each of those was allocated to one of the team. That's the only way we could do it. 
Because if you left one allegation out, the whole house would come tumbling down. One allegation would affect our credibility if it wasn't proved one way or the other. Lord Stevens had told us right at the beginning, go where the evidence takes you. Step by step, eventually you'll get to the top of the mountain. I've been screaming for the last five years that what happened to Dodi and Diana is absolute. 100% murder by these dark forces, which the intelligence services. At the beginning of Padgett, could have looked like quite a lot of lazy people sitting around an office watching TV, because the team were looking at everything we could find. There was an awful lot of that material out there. You believe there was a conspiracy to Definitely. kill Dodie? They been murdered. Dodie and Diana been murdered. Definitely. Go and find the evidence. If there's evidence of a conspiracy, go and follow it. Who would want them dead? 70, 80, 90 percent of the population thought there was something in it. Partly because they were hearing the media's view of it. And I'm, I'm not here to comment on the media one way or another, but they were hearing the media's view. God, it was so much fun while Diana was alive. She kept us all in, uh, you know, fancy cars and nice clothes. We could get away with anything, we could hack anybody's phone, you know, break into the house and nick pictures, whatever we wanted. And then Diana died and like, the fun stopped and circulation poof, fell off a cliff as well. Diana sold so many papers, we kind of wanted to keep her going. Keep her alive in a way. The Mirror chose today to publish the full text of a letter Diana gave Paul Burrell. In his book, the name of the man she suspected of conspiring to kill her was blacked out. Today it was revealed she'd written, My Husband. Paul Burrell's aware this will go down in history. It's the, it's the very precise nature of what she said. A, quote, accident in my car. What that headline is saying and that note is that the Princess of Wales, in 1995, feared there might be a, a plan to get rid of her in an accident. You can't dismiss that, because two years later, she died in a car accident. What it meant for the Metropolitan Police was that here was a piece of evidence, there's actually a letter in existence. At that time, there was a lot in the media about, you know, this three in the marriage and uh, this thought that Camilla was usurping the Princess of Wales. We wanted to know exactly what was behind that note. How did Mr Burrow come by it? Whether you like Mr Burrow or not is immaterial. He was at the centre of her life. All I can tell you is, behind closed doors, I was looking after my friend. She was called Diana. I understood her fight and her struggles, and I knew where all the enemies were. And they were all coming for us at the same time, whether it's the Queen's household or the, the Prince Philip's household or the Prince of Wales household, they were all against us. And what I wanted to do with the book was to defend the princess's memory. Crumbs. <laughs> It's a difficult one for me, because I know why he published it, and I know what he got for publishing it. I can't tell you how I know. It's a substantial, substantial amount of money. The police wanted to see the note, which is a private note, but I thought it was of national importance, and they should see it, to know how vulnerable she was, how frightened she was, and how marginalised she was. I am sitting here at my desk today in October, longing for someone to hug me and encourage me to keep strong. The princess wrote all her letters at her writing desk, a knee-hole desk, I can see it now, um, with her letter rack in front, the alabaster statue of Christ with rosary beads around it, pictures of the boys, this particular phase in my life is the most underlined. 
dangerous. Sure waist rope with blue black ink, cream stationery with a red edge, and a D and coronet central at the top. My husband is planning uh, an accident in my car, brake failure and serious head injury in order to make the path clear for him to marry Tiggy. Camilla is nothing but a decoy. Uh, which, this did surprise me. Tiggy was Tiggy Legberg, who was the nanny for the two princes. That's what Diana believed at the time. She'd been told by somebody that Tiggy Legberg was having an affair with the Prince of Wales. <laughs> who was feeding the princess lies? My husband is planning to get rid of me. That's what Diana wrote. So clearly, in her mind, at the end of October 1995, for whatever reason, this is what she wrote down as her thoughts. We knew at some point we were going to have to deal with this. We were going to have to go and see the Prince of Wales. The allegation had to be investigated. Whether it's the future King of England, Prince Charles, or anyone else, you have to go there. No one is above the law. He couldn't possibly be responsible for the murder of his former wife. That would be the end of the monarchy. The thing for me that was really worrying was the fact that this incident had happened years before. It happened in a foreign jurisdiction. John Stevens, le chef de Scotland Yard, est arrivé Gare du Nord en fin de matinée. We had to get our hands on the evidence. We had to speak to witnesses over there. It was going to be very, very, very complex. Martine Monteil, la directrice de la PJ parisienne, sert de guide. Le monde entier a eu du mal à se dire que la princesse de Galles était morte dans un banal accident. Moi, je peux montrer les, les plans qui ont été faits de l'accident, je peux montrer les témoignages, je peux tout montrer. Il n'y avait rien à cacher. On a fait un bon travail. Le Lord Stevens, quand il est venu à Paris, il avait peur qu'on le prenne mal. But I said, but no, au contraire, refaites-le. That was a very, very important day uh, for me personally to see the actual scene, to get a feel for it all. Unless you do that, you know, you, you're not doing your job properly. On comprend que je, je passe le témoin. Et ça commence par le tunnel. But I just have a simple job to do with my officers. We will do that job. And I think my record speaks for itself. We will get to the bottom of this one way or the other. The collision investigation. You look at the scene. Everything that happened there, the whole technical stuff, was vital to understand where we went forward. Because that's fact. We, you know, let's look at the tire marks, let's look at the debris, let's look at the distances. So I wanted the best collision investigator we could find. I think my first trip to Paris was with um, Sir John Stevens. <laughs> a traffic PC doesn't usually get to speak to people like that. It was just really quite surreal. And, and it carried on being surreal in that way all the way through to the end. You cannot really look at a crash scene afterwards and get the same sense of feeling as you do when you're standing there and it's all laid out in front of you. I drove the route quite a few times. The biggest thing that struck me is that there was a very distinct and quite sharp transition from being almost level road down into the underpass and the slope into it was quite steep. This was a challenging bit of road, especially if you were driving at some speed.
We needed to identify what had been done by the French, if what had been done could have been done better. So it was important, very important for us to get our hands on the car. Otherwise, the overall collision investigation report would have been incomplete, which couldn't be allowed to happen. Who would want them dead? And why would anyone want to kill them, Dodie and Diana? Because they still don't accept that Dodie, my son, an Egyptian, a Muslim, can be the stepfather of the future king. My main area was to speak to friends and acquaintances of Diana, Princess of Wales, to find out whether she was pregnant, whether she was getting engaged, whether she had any security concerns. For most part of it, I was the only female detective, yeah. It was such a high-profile case there was that added weight that nothing in this investigation could get leaked to anyone. There was massive pressure on from the press to actually talk about what we were doing, looking for a scoop, looking for who we were seeing, what our conclusions were. If something had come out which was confidential, I think, you know, our credibility with the French would have gone, our credibility with the royal family, with, with Mohammed would have gone. You also believe, Mohammed, strongly that Diana was pregnant at the time that she died, don't you? This was 100%. How, how can you be sure of that? Because she told me herself, and Dodi told me, I know this personally. We had really no evidence to support what he was alleging, but he claimed that this was a picture of her pregnant. So we had to see whether there was any truth in that. It was about motive, because it could have been, as was being suggested by Mr Al-Fayed, that the royal family didn't necessarily want a Muslim baby within their family. It was a simple question, when was the photograph taken? Because it's all on the timeline then. Mohammed Al-Fayed's villa, where the princess and her sons are holiday guests. Time to enjoy the Riviera sun. I recall trawling through thousands of photographs to find that photograph. This photograph was taken on the 14th of July. The Express itself says this was published on the 15th. The photograph was on the day before, the 14th. Dodie didn't arrive in Saint-Tropez at the family villa until the 14th of July, late. So this photograph, clearly taken during daytime, was taken even before that relationship started. If this had been like the 14th of August, and you said, well, she'd been with Dodie for a month now, then fine. But I'm no gynaecologist. I know that before you've met someone, you can't be showing signs of pregnancy. There were no secrets from Mr. Alfred. There was absolutely no point in trying to keep anything away from him. It was my job to tell him what we were doing and take him through what progress we were making and where the evidence was taking us. We used to come in on the side entrance there. We were met by his bodyguards and his security detail. We had a, a control room which was based really on a police control room, so it was quite a sophisticated business. And Mr. Rafa would just walk into the room, reinforce his view that his son was murdered and so was the Princess of Wales. Lord Stevens listened. I think what Lord Stevens did was I think he dialed down his own personality, his own character. When he went in, he realised this is not a contest of who's most important. He was a character. Uh, on one occasion, he gave him a Viagra. He said, this will help your love life. 
I didn't need any help with my sex life as it happened. And then about a, three or four weeks, four weeks later, he gave me the bull's testicles. I hear, you know, it was, it's quite a strange thing to do, really. Inside the Ritz, Diana and Dodie had dinner in the Imperial Suite. And then they called me, say, what's happening? And then we're having dinner. We're coming back on Sunday and on Monday. They were declared their engagements. Did Dodie tell you that? Did Diana Dodie tell you that? Dodie told me that and Diana told me that on Saturday evening at 10 o'clock. The only evidence, and I'll call it that, was Muhammad al-Fayed saying that he had a conversation with Diana in which she said she was engaged to Dodie al-Fayed and she was pregnant. How can we prove that? How do we check that that's actually correct? We go to Saturday the 30th of August when Dodi and the princess were in Paris. Dodi Alfayed purchased a ring from Raposi's shop in Place Vendôme next to the Ritz Hotel. The Tell Me Yes ring, Dis Moi Oui. C'est une bague qu'il fait partie d'une ligne de fiançailles, mais je ne sais pas si c'était un fiançailles. We do know that that ring was found later in a case in Dodi's apartment in Rue Arsène Hussein. The key issue for us looking at that was, um, what did the Princess of Wales know about that ring? Had she seen it? Had she known the significance of it? And was there any evidence of talk of an engagement? Scotland Yard, he told me if I could bring my testimonies, my proofs, to this inquiry. And that's what I do. Alberto Raposi said that when Dodi and Diana were in Monte Carlo, that they had seen a ring at the Raposi jewellers there. He saw in the vitrine a bag and he indicated it and said, This is perfect. They were definitely going to buy that ring. Um, and so uh, Mr. Raposi was saying that, but it was the wrong size. La bague, elle avait une taille normale que on a dû réduire de deux tailles. Il s'arrêtait trop large. And so it went off to, I believe, an Italian factory to get size during the summer. They had to open up the factory because normally things shut down for the month of August. Il faut faire la livraison au 30 août parce que le premier qu'ils avaient euh, annoncé le fiançaille officiellement. I would never say a witness was lying just because the facts don't all match up. What I'm saying is that what Mr. Raposi said in his statements to us didn't line up with the facts as we knew them. He said that the ring had gone off to Turin for resizing with his brother. That didn't happen, just didn't happen. Uh, and Mr. Posse said, yes, I will go back now and I'll find all the documentation that showed what happened to this tell me yes ring. I didn't produce a single thing. No evidence, nothing at all. que j'étais honnête à 100%. Tout le reste, qu'est-ce qu'ils pensent, les gens et tout, ça me... Absolutely egal. Sometimes you have to look at why are they saying it? What is the driving force for them saying this? People say things sometimes because they think it's the right thing to say. People say things because actually somebody else would like me to say that. That is beautiful. This is the ring, picked up in Paris the afternoon they died. For Mohammed, $700,000 worth of proof positive that his son and Princess Diana were serious about marriage. In 2004, I took a phone call from someone at Scotland Yard. He said, well, we know that you spoke to the princess um, in the hours before her death. We want to talk to you about that conversation. I felt an obligation to help. 
she and I were friends. She called me from Paris. We'd had a conversation. She was coming home and she was looking forward to coming home. She was desperately missing William and Harry. The police wanted to know if the princess had said to me whether she had become engaged. And I said, absolutely not. She had said, as she pretty much said to all the friends, and she always had a particular way of saying this, I mean, I need a new, another marriage like, like a rash on my face. But you know, it, it was very hard to dispute what Mohammed said. I wrote the last story while she was still alive at the, uh, the News of the World. So I get sent down to try and buy up some of the crew on the boat. So I've got a bag with 10,000 quid in it, and we actually get the first mate. And so he was quite a good coup, you know, because he watched them, he spoke to them. So it's like, great, well, you know, so how did they rock the love boat? Did they make love so passionately? Did it move in the water? So that's the kind of line I'm going for. Did they run across the stateroom with no clothes on? Did they go skinny dipping at 3 a.m., all that stuff? And he said, no, nothing happened at all. He called her mom. Uh, they sat at other ends of the table. She had her bedroom. When the kids were there, not even a peck on the cheek. Then when the kids left, um, it was the same. But I wasn't allowed to print that because that wasn't what anyone wanted to read back in the day. There was an expression in newspapers about uh, making it work. Yeah, just make it work. It's almost like make it happen. It's not make it up. It's not quite the same as make it up. But here's a story. Let's just make it work, make it sound believable, make it sound possible. My belief is that the Princess of Wales never saw that ring. I think that Dodio Fayed was going to present that ring later that night. Dodi didn't get the chance to ask the Princess of Wales to get engaged. The Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles appeared at their engagement party tonight. They are to marry on Friday, the 8th of April at Windsor. How are you feeling, ma'am? Just all right. I've just, I've just come down to work. Did he get down on one knee to propose? <laughs> Charles and Camilla have lived more or less as man and wife for the past three or four years, and this was an inevitable step. They'll hope things will be clearer now, even if they do not underestimate the challenge of selling this marriage to a sceptical public. So we were given permission to bring the Mercedes back to the UK. The Mercedes was in two containers in a vehicle scrapyard on the outskirts of Paris. While we were loading the, the shipping containers, you could see paparazzi in the surrounding flats taking photographs. We were followed all the way from Paris to the, the Channel. When we got out of Dover on the other side of the channel, they were in the lay-by on the A2 waiting for us. Delighted for the Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles. It's very happy news. We all wish them every happiness. The general consensus is not a lot of people have a lot against Camilla, but she's just not Diana. Diana was still dominating the news agenda around the royal family. I mean, they were desperate to move on and, and start again. In life, Diana had, if not tormented them, she had caused them an awful lot of trouble, and certainly she had continued to haunt them. You know, she famously said she wasn't going quietly. And boy, that was so true.
During our examination of the car, there were parts of the carpet that had been removed. Um, and one part from um, Princess Diana's side was heavily bloodstained. Now, the importance of that blood is it was pre-transfusion blood. It was pure blood from the princess. This was picked up by somebody else as to whether that might be useful in looking to see if the question about her being pregnant could be answered. We actually DNA'd it, first of all, to make sure this was the princess's blood. And then Professor David Cowan did some very sophisticated tests on the blood. And he came back and said, up to a certain level, all I can tell you is she wasn't pregnant. If she was pregnant by a short degree, it wouldn't pick them up. But it just shows the lengths we went to. I interviewed Rosa Monkton, who was a very good friend of Diana's, and, and she was saying that she could not possibly have been pregnant because of conversations they, they'd had just a few days before. I don't really want to talk about her period and stuff. I just don't feel that's, you know. The thing about pregnancy and the, the, the details about Diana's body were the most unpleasant part of what we did, to be frank. Um, we had to go into intimate details of her sexual life, intimate details of you know, the body clock, so to speak. I can understand anyone saying, well, why do you have to do that and go into the personal details? But to actually ensure that these allegations were investigated properly, to go where the evidence took us, you had to do it. I was aware that in the coroner's court, we will have to go through a legal process in front of a jury, which would be extremely stressful and difficult. The British system of criminal justice is a tragic failure. There are those who say that with a little tinkering here or there, these failures can be prevented. They can't. My name's Michael Mansfield. I was contacted to represent uh, Mohammed Al-Fayed. Michael Mansfield, we all know, is a very clever individual. He specialised in criminal law for 25 years, founded law centres and human rights groups. He successfully defended a large number of major cases where civil liberties have been at stake. We were up against it. You had Michael Mansfield, one of the best defence counsels, and my other man in terms of his ability, with his legal team looking at every single aspect of what we had done and did. The basic question was, what's going on here? Princess Diana was right about the fact she was actually going to meet an untimely occurrence. So I started asking myself who benefits from this, and I started to think, well, I can think of all sorts of people who might benefit. Diana had not exactly ingratiated herself with the royal family. Maybe it was pure accident, but I found that difficult to believe from the beginning. And I thought, this doesn't add up. I wasn't frightened of the establishment. The decision was made to see uh, Prince Charles because of the borough letter and the allegations made in that letter. Princess Diana had stated that she was going to be murdered by her husband. We had to see whether any substance to that and we had to have his uh, reply to it. I'm sure nothing like that had ever happened before. So that was unprecedented. I'd never been to St. James's Palace before. I don't know the right term, a footman, a butler, guided us through. I do remember there were, uh, some of the rooms were ready for a Christmas party as we walked past, because it was early December. I remember thinking I'd rather be going to that party than actually going in to interview a future king.
I explained why we were going there. It was the result of the publication of the letter. He understood the reasons for it and was only too willing to cooperate. He came in, he was extremely charming. I put questions to him which were noted down by Dave Douglas. I'm not a monarchist. I'm not obsessed with the royal family in any way, shape or form. I have to say that Charles was actually very, very polite. Obviously, Lord Stevens is asking him questions and he deliberately, on a couple of occasions, leant past Lord Stevens to ask me general questions about Paget. How's it going? Is the inquiry going okay? He was putting me at my ease by actually including me in the conversation. I thought, that's, that's quite classy. Doesn't matter whether I like the monarchy or not, that's quite classy, I was impressed with that. He denied being involved in any way, shape or form, and uh, that was noted. I don't want to go into what Prince Charles said. All I'll say is that when it came to all of the details in that note, the Prince of Wales couldn't understand any of it. He couldn't understand why it was written. He couldn't understand why those names were put in there. He just couldn't help us with it. He was as flabbergasted as anybody else. When she wrote me that note, the princess was going through a very tricky part of her life. And so she was unstable and her feelings were erratic. Oh, I think a lot of people felt that Diana was a problem. This wasn't an overwhelming case of somebody who, who's uh, off their rockers or whatever phrase you want to use. And of course, it's very convenient if you want to write somebody off, you say they're a bit unbalanced. So they can explain Diana and the whole problem there because she was a little bit, you know. Well, I think the headline's strong enough at the top, but it's just a question of which picture we use. I don't see how anybody can accuse Diana of being overly concerned with her security. She was aware, as the public became aware, that phone calls were being listened to. And there's more of the tape on pages four and five as well. Okay. Squidgy was the uh, tape recording of Diana talking to a man, possibly an extramarital friendship, which began to be circulated in late 1991. <laughs> The Sun newspapers say this tape is genuine. It records an intimate... A 45-minute tape, rambling, incoherent at times, angry about her lot, angry about the royal family. Obviously, I think our readers will be absolutely fascinated by the, the dialogue. As I said, it's not, it's not revelatory in a major way. This is really a, a kind of soul-bearing of a woman who's got many tormented aspects in her life. She did talk to me about her fears that everything she did um, was reported back to the other side. And to the other side, she meant Charles's lot, that because her, her phone calls were tapped, he knew who, who she was seeing, who she was meeting, where she was going. The evidence, as, as it seemed, was quite compelling. Like me, you've got to suffer. People just camped outside wherever Diana was, wherever Charles was, and while they were camping there, they'd just have a scanner on listening. And you'd obviously tape it, because that tape is worth fortunes. For the first time, you actually got the royal family not as they wanted to present themselves, but as they really were. Of course the public are interested in that, and why is that not in the public interest? Princess Diana never knew who was listening to her phone calls. It could have been Prince Charles's camp to get some juicy gossip on her, to, to, to use against her ammunition. It could have been um, the, the security services, or it could have been um, the media. One day, a man came to see us. He said he was an ex-MI5 officer, and he went around all the apartments and listened for devices. Couldn't find anything. 
But then he dramatically said to the princess, well, we have to take down every mirror in the palace because you can shine a beam from outer space onto a mirror, into a room, and listen to the conversation. She believed it was true. She knew that her world wasn't safe. We were told, you know, be, be very careful. You know, there may be phone tapping. A lot of thought and effort went into protecting the, the investigation. There was never a time that we weren't on our guard. Because if you were not on your guard, there are people in the background who, you know, pull the rug from under you, and that's the experience I've had over the years. You have to anticipate that not everybody's on your side. People are going to want to find out what you're doing. People are trying to get sources of information from you. We knew at one stage that we, you know, we were being followed. There's a real feeling of isolation. And who are your allies? Who are your allies? I don't even begin to say I understand the Princess of Wales and what she was going through. But I think when you're in that position, when you're at the centre of media attention all the time, I think you start to see shadows. Mm -hmm. 